Welcome everybody. I see we've got lots of participants joining tonight. So while we wait for others to join in, please go ahead and uh, throw into the chat. If you see the little button at the bottom of your screen, the little speech bubble, it says chat, open that up and throw in there where you are chiming in from tonight. So where are you watching from? Are you in Arizona? Are you somewhere else? We'd love to know. Hey, Jonah from Mesa with a great last name, Webb, very appropriate tonight. Yes. Kelly in Phoenix, we've got folks from Flagstaff, Mesa, 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 lots of Mesa, Fountain Hills. Hey, Scottsdale, South Carolina. All right, Youngtown, Arizona, Dayton, Ohio, Phoenix, Levine, Avondale. Hey, in Chandler, Glendale, we've got some folks in Florida tonight, Scottsdale, all over the country. This is great. California, Chandler. Phoenix, more Chandler, Glendale. All right. Anybody else that's just joining us, go on and, and throw into the chat where you're joining us from tonight. Joelle's joining us from Fry's. Hey, you know what? You got to have your science wherever you are. I appreciate that very much. If you're just tuning in, uh, we're just going to wait a few more minutes as our participants join in and then we'll get going. And while you wait, let us know where you're coming in from tonight. Throw it in the chat where you're watching from. Hey, Mike and Pinedale. Deborah in North Phoenix, hey. Hello to you too, Mary. Joining us from Anthem. So that link worked for you uh, there, Siri? Did. I can put it in the chat if, unless you want to do it. The link to all the files? The, the link to the PDF file. Uh, yeah, I, I had to select it, but it, it did work. OK. But yeah, if you've got links as we chat today, too, I'll, I will definitely throw links in the chat that are appropriate. Hey to Todd. Good to see you, too, coming in from Goodyear. All right, I think we're in a good place to get going. Anybody else that joins us can, um, well, they're just gonna have to jump in midway here. Cool. All right, so welcome everybody. I'm Sari Custer, the Chief of Science and Curiosity here at Arizona Science Center. I'm gonna be your host tonight and I am so excited to welcome you to our virtual chat about the James Webb Telescope. Uh, tonight's talk is made possible uh, with our connections at NASA and also with generous support from our friends at the Richard F. Karras Charitable Trust. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing this screen so that I can see you all, awesome. All right, so before we jump into our talk tonight, I just wanna do a little bit of housekeeping first. You've already figured out how to use the chat. If you're just joining us, I know we have a couple new additions, go ahead and throw into the chat where you're joining us from tonight so that you can practice. We want you to use the chat to communicate with each other, but please just be respectful. I'm sure this isn't your first virtual event. Um, so please feel free to use that chat. However, if you have questions tonight for our speaker, we want you to use the Q&A function. So if you look at the bottom of your screen or right near that chat bubble, we want you to use that Q&A button and put your questions in there because that way not only can I see them and see what the actual questions are, but you all can go into that and upvote questions that you really want answered tonight. So we will use that to manage questions, but I'll do my best uh, to keep an eye on the chat for anything that does pop up over there. Um, and we'll also throw some links in the chat too um, as they become appropriate. So thank you so much um, again for joining us. All right, now onto our main event. Again, I'm really excited. We have an amazing speaker for you all tonight. We have Dr. Rohir Windhorst joining us both as a representative for NASA and from our very own Arizona State University. 
Um, and Dr. Winhurst, you have a long bio, so everybody bear with me um, because this is incredible. Dr. Winhurst is Regents and Foundation Professor at Arizona State University and Interdisciplinary Scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope with NASA. Dr. Winhurst received his PhD in astronomy in 1984 from the University of Leiden in the Netherlands on the nature and evolution of faint radio sources and did postdoctoral work at the Carnegie Observatories and Caltech in Pasadena. Uh, this included work on the wide field planetary camera one before Hubble's launch and since Hubble's launch, he's used most of Hubble's instruments in over 70 funded projects, which I think is incredible. And those focused on the assembly of galaxies throughout cosmic time, the growth, uh, growth of supermassive black holes and distant quasars and he was actively involved in the design of the science program of Hubble's Wide Field Camera 3, which was successfully installed in 2009. Uh, Dr. Winhurst is also the principal investigator of the large Hubble Space Telescope Archival Legacy Project SkyServe. Some of you may have used it or seen it, but it's cataloging for 2 million faint stars, galaxies, and objects across the sky. Um, and Dr. Winhurst has been interdisciplinary scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope, with which he plans to make detailed uh, study of the epoch of first light when the universe was much less than a billion years old, just a billion years old. And I have to throw out there, this is the abridged version of your bio. I can't believe how much knowledge and research is here. So um, ladies and gentlemen, if you wouldn't mind putting some welcoming words in the chat, let's please welcome Dr. Rohir Windhorst. Thank you there, Sari, and everybody for coming tonight, also for pronouncing, pronouncing my name correctly. Um, let's see here. So uh, I was going to share first uh, the movie of the deployments, but I seem to have lost it now. Uh, so we'll start with the screen share first, and then we'll... Um, um, I, in, if you can see this, uh, go to the movie. This is an engineering uh, rendering, so this is not a real film, but it should be close enough um, to what happens in a few weeks when the Webb telescope is outside the Earth um, and uh, outside the Earth's atmosphere and on its way past the moon to the second Lagrange point. Can you see all this? So the solar panels come out. Uh, give me a chat if you can't see this. The high gain antenna comes out, and then two garage door signs. It's looking good. It's not not to interrupt, but just to answer, it is looking yeah. good. Two garage door size pellets with the sun shield come out. So these are not solar panels, but they keep the telescope cold, as you will see in a minute, and they will unfurl in three dimension. The telescope lifts up by a meter and a half. And then the sun shield unfurls with various mechanisms. Um, basically, it consists of five layers of Kapton, which is like your kitchen saran wrap, but very strong, very highly reflective. And it comes out from two telescopic arms, the left and the right side. And then these six vertical structures will bring the five layers away from each other as we go with pulleys cables essentially in these uh, six vertical bars. Once that is done, the telescope is ready to cool. So the secondary mirror comes from over its shoulder and the two side panels with three mirrors will fold into place. And in principle, then we have a workable telescope at that point, which isn't uh, focused yet. And that's what something we do after uh, two months. There's about a month journey to the L2 point and then about a month of cooling, and then about two months of focusing and two months of instrument calibration. So, uh, Sari, I'll be happy to, um, let me see, to stop uh, at any time to answer questions, uh, but I will uh, right now go to the actual talk, uh, which I think I sent you in the chat. And at this point, it will be very difficult for me to, uh, see what questions are in the chat. So I'll lean for you on that to tell me. I'm here for you for that. I'll, I'll keep an eye on it. We do have yeah. two questions already that you may answer when you launch into this, but we might as well just start out with them too. What do we hope to observe with this telescope and how big is it? So I'll jump out and uh, if we answer any of those or if we get new ones, I'll, I'll jump in in between and, and post the questions for you. So I know we have an hour. We're about uh, 10 minutes in or so. 
And so I'll talk about this Webb telescope. The idea first started uh, 1996, even earlier than that, but shortly after Hubble's launch. Hubble was launched in 1990. I won't say much about these other two uh, ground and space telescopes for the future, although I have some spare charts of it. So roughly the first half of the talk, say the first 15 or so minutes will be on the hardware. And then there will be a natural break and then 15 minutes about the science. For the sake of time, I will need to uh, skip some slides, but that should be no big deal because you got them all in the pack here. And I've put this link at the bottom uh, in the chat and Sari has it also can email it to everybody. So uh, I hope you're not colorblind. When I use orange, I mean web. When I use blue, I mean Hubble. And when I use another color, I'll use talk about something else, but I won't get to all points. So I'll only talk to what I reasonably can. Um, the hardware of web, um, what Hubble has done briefly in blue, and then how web can measure the epoch of first light galaxy assembly and supermassive black hole growth. So that'll sort of be the last part of the talk. And then I'll have some spare slides on the future and star formation and exoplanets, which I'm sure uh, some of the young folks in the audience will have uh, questions about, even have some charts on uh, where our folks end up in uh, future careers. So I wanna start out by saying, which was implicit in the first talk, that all of these big projects, not just James Webb, but also Hubble, are 30 to 40 year projects or even longer. Hubble was first conceived in the 1960s and wasn't launched until 1990. So that took a good 25 years from first concept to the launch pad. And, and web hasn't been a whole lot different. It takes you know, a good fraction of a human lifetime to even build these things. And then another fraction of a human lifetime to run the science. So needless to say that we will be wrinkled by the time it's all said and done. Um, I need to move some of these things out of my view here um, so I can better talk to the slides. Mm -hmm. So uh, Webb was the second NASA administrator standing next to JFK here. And he was the one that brought us to the moon in the 1960s. And Hubble, of course, the person was the uh, person that discovered the expansion of the universe. And the Hubble telescope was named after him. Um, so as we'll see, the um, Webb telescope is um, a good bit larger than Hubble Space Telescope, about two and a half times larger. And that then means that at the same wavelength, you get two and a half times better resolution, or at two and a half times longer wavelengths, you get the same resolution as Hubble. And that comes in very handy when you look at very distant objects, such as distant stars and galaxies, or... Um, um, stars and galaxies and, and even planets that are being bor born embedded, uh, surrounded by their own dust. And that's what Webb is really good at. Look at the um, optically hidden star formation uh, that is hidden by dust. And we'll talk about that some too. I just first want to show you how large Webb is. This is not the real thing, of course, children in the audience. This is the traveling model that Northrop Grumman, the prime contractor, has used for many years to show you how large it is. This one has bird droppings on it. The real telescope does not. To the left here, you see a book written by James Webb, not the one that we named the telescope after, by the senator in Virginia, who uh, over a decade ago was um, very useful in helping us revive the, pro the program when it ran into some budget problems. Of course, the program is not worth dying for, but this is a bit of a joke. We are looking for young kids and young students who are willing to work on, uh, on, on web in the next 10 to 14 years, which is the maximum lifetime uh, we can get out of it. I will not say much about deployment now because you've seen the movie, other than to say it's an infrared telescope. It works from the optical red 0.6 microns in wavelength all the way to the mid infrared at 28 or 29 microns. And you have to use these five layers of Kapton to keep it at 40 kelvins. Very briefly speaking, the sun is always on the south side of this drawing. Uh, these are radiator panels that keep the telescope optics cool. This thing here is the solar panels that feed uh, the system its electrical power. And once you get um, 
on the other side of this sun shield from room temperature here, which is roughly 300 kelvins to 40 kelvins here. And this is a minus several hundred um, degrees in Fahrenheit. You can reach the brightness of what we astronomers call 31st and a half magnitude or more uh, generally said, the brightness of one firefly at the distance of the moon, right? When I say FF, I'll mean a firefly. And that's a pretty dim uh, limit to achieve. Hubble can't really quite do that, although its very deepest image has almost reached that deeply, as we will see. Uh, so that's what we're going to aim for, a firefly at the distance of the moon, with the moon not there, of course. So you will see shortly that we're, as of today, actually being hoisted on top of the rocket, where over here we will sit when the fairing is closed completely folded up with the three panels backwards and the secondary mirror over our shoulder. And when the launch is done, after about 20 minutes or so into orbit, the launch fairing separates and the telescope will be released. And at its current weight of 65 kilo, 6,500 kilograms, including its propellant that was loaded in the last few weeks, it will be ready on its way to go to the L2 Lagrange point. What is the L2 Lagrange point? The Earth is here in the center of this gravitational spider web. The moon's orbit is this white circle. I hope you can see my cursor. And in a couple of days, we go past the moon. We have to launch, of course, a day where the moon is not there because we don't want to collide with it. And a point over here, approximately five times further away than the moon, with the moon and the Earth and the sun always behind us here, um, to the lower left of this image. The sun shield will block all of those and the telescope will always look at the region away from the earth and the sun and the moon. And therefore it will uh, always be able to stay cold. Imagine that this, well, it's not the earth, it's my mouse. The Hubble Space Telescope goes around the earth every 96 minutes. That's very tiring for the astronauts that had to fix it. It's also tiring for the telescope that changes from room temperature to a much colder uh, temperature 15 times a day. The Webb telescope, once it has left the Earth and once the sun shield is deployed in a couple of weeks, it will have one sunset and one sunrise. The sunrise happens when the fairing goes off. The sunset happens uh, when the uh, sun shield deploys. After that, it should never be illuminated by the sun. So it's a much more passive system than Hubble with all its active sunrises and sunsets. And from this point, we can observe 70% um, of the time. Hubble looks for 50% of the time at the Earth's oceans or the Earth's continents, which are gravely out of focus. So that's not a very efficient use of time. I will skip this chart with the deployment because you have seen how that works. And um, this is a bit of a technical chart. Each one of these 18, 1.3, five meter, um, you know, four foot uh, diameter um, mirror segments is made out of beryllium, which is like aluminum in the upper left corner of the periodic system of chemical elements. A very lightweight element, much more lightweight than aluminum also doesn't change shape much uh, when you go from room temperature to 40 kelvins, unlike aluminum. Aluminum is very flexible, as you know, from an airplane. Beryllium is not, it's very stiff. And so uh, with these six mechanical fingers or hexapods, um, you know, the engineers plan to push and pull and poke the mirror segments all in exactly the right place to within a very small diameter, much less than 1,000 of a human hair. And that then allows the telescope to have very precise images, um, including taking care of deformations that may have been caused by uh, temperature fluctuations. This is sort of the family portrait of all the hardware that's being put together. together. The primary mirror, the secondary mirror before it was cold coated, the other mirrors here, plus the instrument package, the sun shield, all the support structure. And by the way, we use gold in this infrared telescope, not because the project has so much money. There's only seven ounces of gold in the entire system. 
but because gold, as you can see from my wedding ring, it's very highly reflective at 98% in the infrared. So because there is inside the telescope and its instrument, there's like 14 reflections. You only lose 28% of the light um, by focusing it all. And that's a very efficient system. You get to use more than 70% of the light. So this is the assembly of the model. You can uh, ask one for Christmas. They, you can get them in smaller versions, even from Lego that you can build yourself. I will spare you the details, but you have more or less seen how this works. And in the last uh, six, seven years, it was all put together and tested with the various components. You can see here how large the sun shield is. You can see NASA as its ducks in a row here with all the technicians in front of the sun shield. I have been inside this hall in a bunny suit. You have to be completely clean and dust free to make sure um, that nothing gets contaminated while that's being done. And here you can see various stages of the building. I will spare you the details, except to say that once upon a time, NASA didn't want to have covers on the mirror. And I asked for covers because you know this was in 2012, 2013. There was a fair chance that we would be staring at the ceiling for a couple of years. So we didn't want too much dust to collect on the mirrors. And indeed, they gave us dust covers for a while. And here's how you can see how two Olympic divers on diving boards, while well, they're NASA technicians, very carefully lift off these dust covers. This was, of course, done before it all got mounted for launch. And so that's now how we have now a very clean telescope. Here it is on a merry-go-round that you can point in every which direction. This is one of the largest buildings NASA has. Also, the Hubble Space Telescope was once upon a time in this building in 1981. And you can see the NASA logo, the NASA meatball is on the wall there. Now, if you look at the next picture, you can see the entire team with the Nobel laureate, John Mather cracking the whip here. And you see that the NASA logo is now behind us and it's reflected in the mirror, but it's a mirror image and this is distorted and that's a good thing. So the mirror is doing what it's supposed to do, it, it enlarges. Yeah, so we have a working six and a half meter mirror now. Um, that um, you can see here under various angles. And then I have a couple of charts, I'll spare you some details, but we have four instruments, one made for the near infrared by Marcia Ricci at the University of Arizona. And the one on the upper left here is the Canadian fine guiding sensor and basically holds the telescope still with two detectors to make sure it doesn't move when the main camera is taking an image. The Europeans also built a mid-infrared instrument that works at the longer wavelength and a near-infrared spectrometer that allows you to take spectra or rainbow, um, rainbows uh, of a very large number of objects. So um, 14 to 16. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm so sorry, we have a, a quick question that might just be relevant to the, yeah. the last couple of slides because you showed us some great imagery of testing and building. Yeah. Uh, the question is, how long did it take to, to even get to that point? So to, to build the working telescope, how there were dates like 2014, you mentioned 2012. So when did this all start? Well, we started in 2001. Um, but it took about 10 years of designing and testing and some budget issues and making sure to do everything as cheaply while still reliably as possible. It wasn't until 2007, 2008 that they started building the real things. And then in the early 2010s, 2011, 2012, they had instruments ready that could be uh, tested. I have some more pictures of that. Let me skip this one for the sake of time. Um, for instance, the entire telescope when it was built, well, as early as 2016, but in 2019, the secondary mirror was mounted and it was fully tested. Now look what these technicians are doing. While this mirror comes from over the shoulders, um, like you're throwing a basketball, of course, it goes very slowly. slowly. You can see all these technicians looking at it and they're not actually touching it, but there are cables from the ceiling that help this motion excuse me, go back and forth. 
And you have to do it under this direction horizontally because otherwise the redundant motors over here and there um, would be overstretched if you did it in one gravity while pointing up. So this is how the testing was done of the secondary mirror. And the same was done for the deployment of these mirrors to the side, which was tested earlier. So you will see, and over here also, soon in a couple of other charts, a lot of testing was done um, while offloading the gravity because you don't want to overstretch the motors. Once you're past the earth, you're in zero gravity. So the motors are actually very weak on purpose. So how do you transport this thing from the various building chambers to the testing chambers? Well, it doesn't fit in the overhead compartment. So here is the, uh, the enclosure that uh, takes two freeway, two freeway lanes and uh, a 36 wheeler. And it was then the entire telescope was removed from this enclosure into this thermal vacuum chamber that has over there a 14 meter door. And this was the same vacuum chamber where in the 1960s, the Apollo capsules in the upper stage of the Saturn V was tested. So you roll the telescope in, uh, you remove the technicians, you cable it up, and then you close the door and you spent a couple of weeks to pump it vacuum and bring it down to 40 kelvins. And then at top of this chamber, there is a testing tower that provides an image to the telescope that exactly mimics what a star in space would look like. And this is how you check that all these mirrors are precisely aligned with respect to each other and provide a perfect image. Yeah, so excellent question. I'll take some more of these questions. This is how we test the sun shield. Again, it's done in one gravity, but all these layers with these telescopic booms here are being pulled out and then separated vertically. And the first time they tried it, of course, one of the pulleys got stuck, so they had to repair it and try it again and again. Each of these processes uh, took a few months to do from beginning to end. So you don't wanna do it too often, but here's the sun shield completely folded up in the vertical position with the telescope ready to be mounted in between. And that was done over, oops, I think I went too fast. The telescope was mounted on top of the sun shield. Then eventually with the spacecraft underneath, this was done also a few years ago before the pandemic started. <clears throat> we worked through the pandemic, like here's the solar panels, again, mounted from the ceiling to be rolled out vertically with a very weak motor and just to make sure that that worked. And there's the solar panels uh, folded up. And so in the last uh, year, year and a half, uh, you know, the technicians have made sure that everything works, every mechanism works. And the hardest part was actually, you know, something went wrong there initially. Um, there was some shaking that needed to be done um, to make sure we could survive the launch loads on a shaking table both vertically and horizontally, we shake it pretty hard. This was one of the most dangerous parts of the entire mission, other than the launch itself. Because if you had a major earthquake, this is in Redondo Beach, California, right at that stage, that wouldn't be so good because you had to move the whole telescope over a dark parking lot at night to mount it on that table. And after they were mounted on the table, of course, there was an earthquake in El Monte. It was only a Richter four, so it wasn't too bad, but we surely could measure it. And um, in an earlier version of this shaking test, we lost a few nuts and bolts and that set us back by half a year, a couple of years ago. So Gary, uh, sorry, this would be a good time to ask some more questions while I'm uh, winding through all these technical charts and see what else um, we do have lots of questions in here, and some of them uh, might be good for later. So let me just jump yeah. back here because I thought there were a couple that were still good in this area. So, um, the hardware, yeah, that'd be why, good. Why is the primary mirror composed of many gold hexagon pieces? Why because the shape? It's too large to be made um, out of one single monolith. And it's much easier to make this way than with these hexapods underneath. It's much easier to steer each of these 18 mirror segments, which we have tested in that large vacuum chamber that you saw earlier, the one that contained the Apollo once upon a time in Houston. And um, I'm curious too, what, what was the decision to make it the hexagon shape versus say a triangle or another shape that may, may be smaller, but why that particular shape? Well, you wanna have a, as few as possible of these hexagons, but you wanna make them 
as large as you can and still steer them and sort of 1.35 meter seems to be the sweet spot which means you need to have five mirrors across and then you end up with 18 mirrors you know with a hole in the center and that's exactly what they built and there's a precedent for this right we have this in the CAC telescope and other telescopes on the ground that contain another layer surrounding it that's the CAC 10 meter telescope that contains 36 of these which are a little smaller than our mirror segments. I think it's worth noting that our friends in the chat here have said hexagons are the bestagons, and I actually think that's great. Hexagons yeah, they are well. a good way to put it, yeah. <laughs> they are um, the so, best way of covering a plane, yeah. That's fabulous, thank you for answering that. Um, there's a question here, Sydney wants to know how much uh, the telescope weighs. Uh, 6,200 and some kilograms, plus 300 kilograms of propellant. So we are under our weight limit. The total limit is uh, 6,500 kilograms, but uh, the French say that the Ariane is, is actually much more powerful than that. If we had weighed seven tons, they would have launched it too. But we had made sure for many years, this started in 2012, that we would weigh less than 6,200 uh, 6, kilograms when we got to the launch pad. And, and that's what we are, plus the propellant. And you need some propellant to stay in that L2 point because it's not a single point. It's actually an enormous volume that's about a million kilometers tall and a million kilometers thick and wide. So it's 10 to the 18 cubic kilometers. It's not like low Earth orbit where you have 10,000 satellites and 100,000 pieces of debris go around in a layer around the Earth that's about 200 kilometers wide. This is an enormous volume. And there's only a few other satellites there. And it's not a stable volume. If you don't use propellant every few weeks, you drift out. So it's very, very empty. Um, very good questions. We've got a couple questions that want to revisit um, the metals and colors. So um, what metals were used the most uh, in the building the telescope? We talked a little bit, uh, maybe revisiting beryllium and gold, and then why, um, related to that, why the mirror is yellow. So if you could just revisit that for a minute. So the mirrors are yellow because they're gold coated and gold is yellow. Most of the material, I'll go back to an earlier chart, is the support structure that you like these uh, tripod bars and, and what's now coated with um, um, and, and kind of an aluminum uh, um, um, material to make it more reflective. But originally it was all epoxy, you know, sort of a hard carbon fiber structure that also expands very little. You could see it even in some of the earlier, there's a lot of this kind of material that makes up most of the support structure. And then of course the beryllium, um, each one of these is 20 kilograms in weight. So gold is actually only seven ounces, but it was needed that much to, call, uh, to coat all the reflective optics to get maximum performance. Thank you. So we have another question um, that's a little bit more general. What do we hope to observe with this telescope? Well, that's a very good point. Uh, we're one slide away for the second part here. So let me get to that. I figured that might be a good transition. And yeah. there, there are still several other questions, but I think maybe they can wait uh, towards the yeah, end I, to I They're a little more specific. Around later on. So this was taken early this morning in French Guiana. And there is the truck with the James Webb and its enclosure on top being hauled into this room with a, a giant forklift and then it will be doors closed. The enclosure will be taken off uh, tonight and tomorrow and it we will be hoisted on top of the rocket which has been inside this assembly building for a couple of months. And once that is done, they will fuel up the rocket and um, roll it out to the launch pad which is a couple of miles away for safety reasons. Yeah, so that's it for the hardware. Uh, we're right up to date. So now we get to our Hubble wide field camera three and everything Hubble has done on um, galaxy assembly and supermassive black hole growth. So I will show you a very tiny part of the sky here that is not a whole lot bigger than the amount of sky you see. Let me see. I used to have a straw here. I'll use a pencil instead. I hope you can see that. So it, Imagine I take this pencil and I look at the sky, but I don't use an ordinary pen. I, I use a, a, 
a red stirrer strong and a stirrer strong has two holes and each one of these holes would be about this much angle of sky that I would look at through my eye. So it's actually very small total angle of sky, much less than the diameter of the full moon. And inside that area, you see thousands of galaxies. So I want to get it straight for the record. Almost everything you see here is a galaxy, another star. You'd be hard pressed to find a single star here. There's a couple, I believe that may be one. So stars, for stars like the sun, there are drops on the windshield. When you drive with your telescope to intergalactic space and you look at all these galaxies and galaxies are like houses with lots of stars in it. Now each galaxy can contain billions and billions of stars if it's a giant galaxy. And our own galaxy would look something like this. We'll show you some more images later. But all these other little dots over here are more distant galaxies. This one over here, like our own, it's not our own galaxy, but it would be a relatively close neighbor that's only a few billion light years away. These ones over here are like six or seven billion light years away, which is halfway between us and the edge of the visible universe, which we currently have at slightly more than 13 billion light years away from us. And Webb will push further back into time by another couple of 100 million years, but up to half a billion years, up to the first uh, two or 300 million years back in time. And it will see objects there that are as faint as one firefly seen from the distance of the moon. Now, Hubble hasn't quite seen that deeply, but about a factor of 10 to 100 uh, more bright, uh, because it is not as large a telescope. Uh, but so each one of these images basically provides you a picture of cosmic history. And uh, the further back you look in time, the further away you look to earlier um, phases of the universe. I want to get more or less right away onto the black hole topic because I know it's on, on everybody's mind. And there are at least two questions about black holes already. Yeah, well, I will we'll, we'll probably get to them in the next five or 10 minutes. So give, let me give this introduction. Everybody is familiar with waves. Waves in solids we call earthquakes or shocks. Waves in liquids we call surf. And, and wave, waves in gases we call sound. That's the, you know, the sound I produce when I go over time. Uh, those are not electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves over here run all the way from long wavelength radio to microwave infrared to visible waves that contain the colors of our spectrum to ultraviolet x-rays and gamma ray waves which are very short wavelength uh, um, uh, electromagnetic waves and they typically are the same size and wavelength as the characteristic object that causes them you know atomic nuclei atoms molecules um you know microscopic scales like dna viruses and then eventually you know butterflies people and, and and rockets that produce the long wavelength radio waves and radio towers of course but there is a fourth fifth kind of waves really those are the gravitational waves and that's when two very dense objects they don't have to be black holes they can be simply neutron stars but black holes are the most exciting when two black holes are either grown up together or they get too close together in space and when they merge they cause this gravitational ripple and this was observed about six years ago for the first time with this LIGO observatory it got the Nobel Prize a few years later two of these giant L-shaped laser tunnels that found a ripple in space-time and the ripple sort of looked like a fish here if you wish this is the uh, spin up frequency of the black holes when they go around each other and it really sounds like a chirp like bzzzt. and it makes that kind of sound if you turn it into a sound but it's really a contraction and a vibration in space time the top panels is what i observed the middle panels is what uh, kip thorne came up with the same guy who made the interstellar movie uh, with a, a relativistic model and the, the, the third panels are the difference and the bottom panels is the visualization. And you can see these two observatories that are 2000 kilometers apart observe the same thing. And the most logical explanation was that two black holes, each almost, you know, 29, 36 solar masses merged and they produced, yes, indeed, they produced not a 65 but a 62 solar mass black hole during that merger. The merger only took a few tens of seconds, 
uh, so 0 0.1, 0 0.2 seconds. And during that merger, three solar masses was lost and it was turned into energy. So very for a very brief moment, following Einstein's famous equation that the energy is the mass times the square of the speed of light. S speed of light is an enormous number. Square is even bigger. So three solar masses was turned into energy in, in about a tenth or two of a second. And this was the most energetic event in the universe at that time. It outdid everything else in the universe that was shining for a very brief moment. So it got the Nobel Prize, and it is produced by these kinds of stars that we now see here with our own wide field camera three in a neighboring galaxy. And a star like the sun wouldn't even be visible in the image, it would be formed at the end of a pillar of dust like this. I got spare charge later. That's where stars like the sun form. But these are the more massive stars that um, live fast and they die young. Don't do this at home. But stars do that if they're three to 10 solar masses or sorry, 10 to 30 solar masses, they will typically leave about a third of that mass, three to 10 solar masses behind in black holes. This happens fairly frequently. Every, um, you know, once in a while, a, a star cluster like this is born and very quickly in a few million years, the stars burn up very quickly and they leave a black hole behind. But they're tiny black holes. They're only, you know, three to 10 to 30 solar masses which is what LIGO saw. So I compare them to my child, baby black holes. They've probably been around from the very first few hundred million years. They were very inefficient eaters. And here we are 12 and a half, 13 billion years later, they're still baby black holes. So these are the baby black holes. We think they happen very frequently. Uh, they're hard to observe, but LIGO has observed them. And we hope to also observe them with the Webb telescope. And, uh, in a way that is, um, you know, I will spare you the details, but we hope to be able to see. Of course, you can't see a black hole directly. You cannot see it because it sucks up due to its enormous gravity, uh, all, all the light that surrounds it, which is why it's black. And, you know, stated technically, the escape velocity from a black hole would be larger than the speed of light. Therefore, you can never escape. Once you fall in, you're out of luck. And therefore, it will always look black. Now we also have supermassive black holes and they sit in the centers of galaxies. Again, don't do this at home, uh, but they produce enormously strong relativistic radiation. The black holes aren't actually black. Now these are monster black holes. They weigh a billion solar masses or three or six billion solar masses. And they're not very appetizing places to be. If you are unlucky enough to be at the end of this relativistic jet and you look right down the pipe, you know, like this cartoon here says, unpleasant things can happen. And uh, we have quite a few examples of that in the universe. Like uh, we have seen black holes in neighboring galaxies for the first time uh, two years ago. Uh, we can see a shadow that surrounds a black hole. And here's the black hole. It's a couple of times the size of the solar system. And the technicians have shown with a telescope that contained dishes all over the earth, very high resolution. They said, you know, this central hole in this image uh, has to contain about 6 billion solar masses worth of black hole. Now that's not a baby black hole. And what is so beautiful about this, this happens in every giant galaxy. There is not a baby, but a monster black hole. So this now brings us to the second kind of black holes that's hidden behind and the gas and the dust in every galaxy, including this neighbor of ours, which is Centaurus A. This is one of our Hubble images. And deep in the center of this galaxy, here you can see an uh, unenlarged image from the ground with also with radio telescopes and with X-ray telescopes from space. In the center is a massive black hole there, and it's squirting out these relativistic jets of very hot radiation. Uh, we can see these kinds of black holes easily to the very edge of the universe. Here's an example done with Hubble by our team. Um, the uh, left panels are the observations at infrared wavelength. It just looks like a star because it's not really a star, but it looks like a star. And the middle panel is a model and the, uh, the right panel is a subtraction. These giant black holes, these billion 
solar mass black holes are supposed to sit in the centers of galaxies. This was a bit of a problem because the galaxy wasn't actually there. You see almost nothing here, maybe a little bit to the right, but nothing to speak of. Now I wanna put this in perspective. This black hole accretion disk, that's really what it is, is at the edge of the universe at a redshift of 4.2, where the universe was 7.4 times smaller than today and only 900 million years old. Yet the uh, amount of light that comes out of this accretion disk surrounding that black hole is 10 to the 14 solar luminosities. And it comes from a region that is, you know, as small as Pluto's orbit. So we'll let that sink in. Last time we went to Pluto with the New Horizons uh, mission, we took pictures of Pluto and also of the sun. You know, looking back at the sun, there was exactly one um, solar luminosity out there, namely the sun 40 astronomical units away from, from, from Pluto. Here you have a scenario where you have uh, 100 billion solar luminosities in the same radius. Now that's a good place to get a suntan. In fact, it will kill you in a picosecond. So this, what this really is, is a monster black hole, 3 billion solar masses seen as early as 900 million years after the Big Bang. So this is not a baby black hole. This is a monster black hole. And I, uh, I liken it to my cat. Um, my, my cats are always eating. They never seem to stop. And these, these monster black holes have eaten catastrophically and secretly for the first billion years until they run out of food, but they're still around today. So Webb will find these first quasars, as we call them, and uh, also the galaxies or the mini galaxies that are surrounding them. And, and that is what Webb will do. How we're doing with time here, uh, Sari? We're doing just fine. We've got about another 15 to 20 minutes or so. If we go a little over, we'll be all right. Okay. We can have some other questions. Well, I have a couple of more Perfect. science charts and then I'll conclude and I'll have a lot more time for questions. So the question is, can this happen to us nearby? Can we fall into a monster black hole? Uh, no and yes. Uh, first of all, our galaxy is fine because if this were our own galaxy, it's not. It's a an artist impression of the Andromeda Nebula. We're not close to the, uh, you know, uh, 10 million solar mass black hole in the center. We're sort of two thirds away from the edge to the center. And our star, the sun with the solar system takes about 220 million years to go around. So we're far enough away from that black hole, roughly by 24,000 light years. But what is going to happen to our galaxy? Now, these are all simulations, except the upper left panel. That is a real image of the sky. This is the Milky Way, of course real mountains. And that is the Andromeda galaxy there that you can see at night. If we have a clear night tonight, you just look in the northeast, small telescope, you can see it. Now Hubble, the astronomer, was the first one to discover that all galaxies move away from each other uh, at a speed proportional to their distance. Uh, that was the expansion of the universe. But he found a few exceptions. And one of the exceptions was Andromeda. Andromeda is actually moving towards us. Well, you say that's not a big deal because you know at the speed that Andromeda is moving towards our own galaxy, it will probably fly right by in four or five billion years. Well, not so, because Hubble the telescope not only measured the uh, expansion velocity of the universe and how, how fast Andromeda is moving towards us, but it also showed there was no lateral motion between our galaxy Andromeda, ergo uh, Andromeda, in 1 billion years, 2 billion years, 3 billion years, 4, 4.5 and, and 5 billion years, is going to collide with our galaxy just fine. And the two black holes in the centers are going to merge. And LIGO will have a super detection of the growth of a supermassive black hole that will end up in the center of this galaxy, which is a, uh, will become a giant elliptical. You don't have to sell your real estate just as yet because this is four and a half to five billion years from today, but it will happen. Um, so uh, I'll spare the details how we measure the, the distances of galaxies, just to say that this is our almost 600 hour image in 13 filters. It took um, 892 orbits, um, or oh, sorry, 841 orbits to take with Hubble. And this is now, you know, a tinier area than at the end of my red stir straw. It's about uh, three arc minutes on the side. 
and almost everything except for this Christmas tree star and that Christmas tree star. Those are drops on the windshield of our intergalactic car. Everything else is a distant house or a distant galaxy. And some galaxies come in groups or in clusters. And the furthest galaxies here are the reddest objects. You can sort of see that over here in the previous chart. Um, because of the expansion of the universe, the typical spectrum of a, a hot star or a hot galaxy that consists of young stars looks like something that gets a lot bluer towards the shorter wavelengths. And then there's an enormous drop because the hydrogen in the foreground uh, below a wavelength of 1216 angstroms eats away all the light. So it looks like a sudden drop of a, a whole uh, a pile of light. And the further the object is, the larger the distance or the redshift Z as we call it. And the further this whole um, uh, scenario that we observe will be shifted to the right, to the point that at the highest redshifts we think we might observe a web, the um, bluest three or four filters will contain no light at all, and the reddest three or four filters will contain the light of that object. And that's how we measure the distances. That's how we have also done it for Hubble. You can see there are some of these very red objects over here, and there's some more over here that I'll just point out in a minute. And those are literally the reddest, the most distant galaxies at the edge of the visible universe. There are some more over here that are kind of hard to see. You'd have to look inside the circles here. I'll try to make an enlargement of these circles over here, if I can do that without. Can you see me enlarging that? Yes, we can. Um, now, the green circles are redshift or seven or eight, where we're looking back roughly 700 million years after the beginning. And the orange circle is redshift nine, where there is an object there that's seen in the first five or 600 million years. And this red circle is a redshift 11, where we're looking at the first 400 million years, give or take. And if you don't believe there's an object there, I'm going to ask you to bear with me. I need to look. This never seems to work unless I go back to the um, original viewing here. Um, there's an object there. If I now collapse all these filters and put them in a false color, so this is no longer true color, you can convince yourself, hopefully, that inside all of these circles, there is a real object there, including the red circle, but the red circle only had a detection in the reddest 13, uh, uh, reddest single filter out of 13. And this object had a detection in the reddest two filters out of 13. And this one was a detection in the reddest three filters and so on. So that's how we know what the approximate redshift or distances of these objects are. And there are real objects in all of them. But you can see that the sky is getting really crowded here. First of all, there's plenty of these objects, redshift seven or eight, and first seven or 800 million years. Uh, but there's very few at the other redshift. So that the object um, supply, you know, the number of objects per volume is quickly thinning out if you go to the larger distances. And the sky is getting very crowded here. The galaxies start overlapping because um, the images are so deep and the telescope only has a finite resolution. So uh, let me see. Let me go back once more to the original magnification. The only good way to do it is this way. If we now push this to other techniques with Hubble, this is something I, Einstein actually highly doubt it could ever be observed. He was a bit annoyed when he wrote this paper a century ago. A colleague of him had asked him to write a paper on gravitational lensing. Now, imagine you have this enormous city. It's like the LA city with all the suburbs and downtown, every galaxy being a city um, in the greater LA area. And it has an enormous pile of mass, in this case, about 10 to the 15 solar masses. There is so much mass here that all the galaxies in the background, like this nice blue one, they get actually not only magnified and stretched, but you see them three or four different times. So I'm going to count the number of blue galaxies. One, one and the same, one and the same, one and the same. The real object is somewhere over here, but it's light because of the enormous distortion of space gets stretched in four different directions. And you see that galaxy four times. This is also happening to this red galaxy, which is further away. 
and some of the other objects, this nice spiral galaxy like our own, you can see it four times as well. So we now use these clusters of galaxies as what we call cosmic houses of mirrors or gravitational lensing to magnify what's behind it. And with a little luck and observing enough of these, we hope to see the very first galaxies and also the very first star clusters and per perhaps occasionally the very first stars directly. So the universe then becomes, you know, you can't see the forest for the trees anymore because the images will be so dense. And to pile up on top of that, the universe will become a house of mirrors because every galaxy we look at behind a cluster of galaxies won't be visible once, but four times. So uh, welcome to the mess of the relativistic to the expanding universe. We hope to make sense out of all of this when we, uh, we see the first web images. Um, and we hope to do it in a way that Einstein thought we could never observe. We hope, hopefully show with web that we can do this routinely. For the sake of time, I'll leave it at that. The rest is all charged for spare. And I will show you my conclusions here and uh, go back to the conclusions at the end. And I'll be glad to take some more questions and we'll open this chat here. So go ahead, Sari. Tell me what you want me to talk all about. Right. Our number one question at the moment, um, and thank you, because that was absolutely fascinating, and I can't wait till we get images. Uh, but I uh, the question is, I understand the telescope is going to be deployed into a Lagrange point. Do yep. Lagrange points tend to collect space dust material? If so, could they create any risks? Yes, they, they do. And, and of course, we have a good sense of that. Um, I'll go back to... For, for most images, I have a hardware answer. So Hubble had an outside titanium shield. And this shield had been in space for three and a half years. And then the astronauts brought it back in 93. They stuck the new white field camera two in. And then we used this old white field camera one to turn it into white field camera three, which is inside the telescope now. But the outside titanium shield had been hammered by micrometeorites for um, um, for three and a half years in space. So we have a pretty good idea of what the density is. Now, none of these micrometeorites ever made it through, but some of them created little pock marks that you can see with the unaided eye. So the, 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 the James Webb Sun Shield, which is more than 10 times larger than this two square meter panel, uh, will have some holes in it. It will look like a Texas road sign after 10 years. Um, so, and it, it is built for that. That's why we have five layers so that the holes will almost never point the telescope straight at the sun. So we get stray light from the sun. But eventually, you know, um, the sun shield is, is the, the most brittle part. And also the, um, the mirrors will have some, some little potholes in it. Very good question. But the, the, the micrometeorites, where this comes from, first of all, L, L2 is not a stable point. So anything that gets deposited there by comet trails, let's say, eventually drifts away and starts orbiting around the sun. But of course, there's always fresh particles. And uh, you, you may know that the Hubble Space Telescope or in low Earth orbit also goes through these old comet trails a few times a year. There's the Bergeids in August. We can see them with the unaided eye when they fall in the atmosphere. And there's the Leonids in November. And what they do with Hubble then, they, if, if, if the, 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 the meteorite trail comes from this direction, they park it with the butt in the wind for, so to speak, for a couple of hours to minimize the cross section. And we can do the same with Webb. We can, if this were the sun shield, we can rotate it under such an angle that when these mic micrometeorites come in, that the angle is minimized. But there will be some of that. Great question. Great question. Yeah. Right? Turn it into the wind. Um, and the next question is actually sort of related in the same way. Um, Hubble can be repaired or could be repaired because it was in low Earth orbit. Are there any contingency plans in case repairs or adjustments are needed to be made uh, post-launch for the James Webb Telescope? Well, we, we talked about this for a long time in the early 2000s. So Hubble, of course, has had five servicing mission and a launch mission with the, with the space shuttle. And, and Webb was designed to, um, in L2 to not do that. First of all, we have no easy way to get astronauts out to L2. I mean, it could be done, but it's going to be very risky and very costly. And so the paradigm there in the early 2000s is to instead give 
we have a lot of spare parts. So we have six gyros, six reaction wheels, a number of batteries, number of spacecraft computers. And if one of them gets hosed by a micrometeorite, which is very unlikely, never happened to Hubble in 31 years, uh, but it can happen, then, you know, most likely there will be another spare part that uh, is still functional. Um, eventually we'll run out of fuel after 10 or 14 years, depending on how we use the telescope. So, you know, it, it's built to function at least for five years. That's the requirement with the goal of 10 years and a, uh, a lifetime supply of propellant for 14 years. So in 10 to 14 years, we, we are going to run out of some parts and we need to start using the spares. So in other words, it is not designed to be serviced. A future generation that would move to um, um, L2 would be built to be serviced and have astronauts go there probably. Excellent Have question. Great questions tonight. Yeah. Since you, you, you mentioned this too. So uh, there is a very specific question asking about fuel. So does the telescope circle around the L2 point on its own or do you have to expend fuel to keep it circling, which I think you just answered, but we'll ask it anyway. Yeah, so if I go back to that gravitational landscape, the spider web of the earth and the moon and the sun, it was at the beginning. Let me go find it, you have it yourself. I don't have the chart number at heart, but it was over soon this one so you describe what we call a lizard you figure it's sort of like you can make it with a game called spirograph it's a circle that goes around circles kind of and the amplitude in all three directions is about a million kilometers if you stay within that envelope you won't drift out but the the, the point itself is unstable this is why we don't collect a lot of asteroid dust unlike the other the fourth and the fifth Lagrangian point, they are stable. So if you go the Earth, Sun, Lagrangian points L4, L5, which are at 60 degree, excuse me, angles from the Sun and the Earth, there you will find a lot of debris piled up. You don't have that here. It's as soon as you go there, you stay for a few weeks, you drift out. So every 14 days, we will need to have a brief squirt of the propellant to push us in their direction so we keep orbiting there. Yep. So when the fuel does run out, is there a risk of losing the telescope at all? Yeah, when the fuel runs out, uh, then game is over. We had for a while uh, a refueling cap there and a refueling of satellites in low Earth orbits. It happens a fair bit today. I won't say it's routine, but it can be done like refueling an airplane. You can do it with a satellite too, but only in low Earth orbit. We don't have that capability for Webb. So it is a, a mission with a limited lifetime. Um, so it, it's different in that regard from Hubble. So I know we have a, a lot of young folks in the audience. Let me show you what's on the drawing board for after Hubble and Webb. And Hubble, by the way, is, um, let's see, uh, you know, between um, more than seven years past its warranty expiry. So this is the true size of Hubble and the Webb telescope. The Webb telescope is two and a half times larger than the Hubble diameter over here. This is the size of the future telescope that looks like Webb. It's not funded yet. It, you know, Webb needs to function first. But as I said before, it takes 15 to 20 years to build these things. You could build them much larger than Webb if you like. And the uh, Astronomy Decadal Survey just came out with a recommendation to study building something like this. And you can see it is yet again more than twice as large as a web. And you can make it. And once they start making something like this, they'll probably first send it to the space station and then deploy it and then move it to L2 with the possibilities that astronauts in 20 years could go visit it and then remove a module if something breaks and fix it. So that's yet a different paradigm again. The trip to L2 is about two months, so it is doable, but it's not without risk for astronauts. It's not like going to Mars, which takes six months. We've got, um, I know we're past our, our 7.30 window, but we've got maybe two last questions here that I think are worth asking. Yeah. Um, one of them is about, um, and of course I just clicked off the question here, but basically looking for life in outer space will, um, excuse me, web enable us to look for exoplanets and is there a hope uh, to use data to find life outside of Earth? 
Yeah, so one of the things Web can do is uh, a bit of a pilot program with Hubble already. So there's a bright star. This star is not a quasar. If you do very careful observation of the star, you can subtract the star pattern, which looks like a star. And in this case, you were actually left with three or four images of planets called, in this case, B, C, D, and E. I don't know where E is, but the other three planets are very clearly visible. You can do that in other ways as well. Um, with Web, Web, of course, will have much better resolution. And one of the common ways this is done these days, you take an, an image of a star or a spectrum of a star, and the star, of course, itself has steady light. We'll call that one or 100%. But when a planet with an atmosphere goes in front, there will be a little bit of a dip, about 2%. And it takes a couple of hours, and then it becomes 100% again. That's when the planet goes in front of the star. And during the time where the planet first become, uh, starts occulting the star, you get sort of a shallow dip and a shallow, what we call egress. And, and that's where the atmosphere is uh, the best measurable. And during those times, you can do this many times in a row. You could actually take a spectrum where, where the black is the data and the blue is the model and convince yourself that the spectrum shows the features of water in this case, perhaps the feature of CO2 if you stare long and hard enough. This is a 28 hour simulation. So a couple of these ingresses and egresses and certainly water. And if you're really lucky at the shorter wavelengths, you might also find ozone. So you now would have evidence for the building blocks of life. That doesn't mean there is life on that planet or intelligent life, but at least you have the building blocks. And if you could show the presence of ozone, which may take this larger future telescope to do it well. Then you could say, well, maybe there's plant life there. Otherwise, how would you have gotten ozone? Yeah, how is that? Oh, that's awesome. That's, uh, that's actually really exciting information. Yeah. Um, I'm going to bring us back down. There's a couple of questions specifically for you, Dr. Windhurst, on how you got involved in the James Webb project in the first place. And I'm going to amend that by tacking on what's the one thing that you hope to learn through the, the life of this particular project? Well, what got me into astronomy in the first place is my father, when I was a kid, we, we built a small telescope. It was no bigger than my hands, you know, but it had a four centimeter uh, lens and you could see the moons of Jupiter and the rings around Saturn, which was quite stunning in the 1970s. And then of course, when I uh, did my dissertation, I heard from my advisor that uh, in the US, they were, I, I did my degree in the Netherlands, but that the US was building this thing called the Large Space Telescope. It didn't have the Hubble name yet. Say, so, well, that sounds like a good thing to start working on when I'm done with my dissertation. So in, indeed, that's what happened. I went to the Carnegie Observatories in Caltech and got involved in the Hubble Telescope project even before launch. Uh, the one thing that I hope to do with the Webb Telescope is things that Hubble can't quite do yet, although we're beginning to see it in this gravitational landscape of these large lensing clusters here. Um, I haven't shown it here. That's part of a more technical talk. But there are some perimeter area where if you place a star right behind it, it in principle could get infinity magnification. Infinity is kind of an ideal case. You won't get it in reality. But you could get a magnification of 10,000 times or 100,000 times. And so our hope is that we will, because the cluster itself moves in a lateral fashion across the sky, that occasionally these in infinity points will go across a distant star in the very early universe and magnify it by more than 10,000 times. That means for a couple of months in a row, or maybe a year, we could see it above the noise in the images. And Hubble has seen a couple of those events uh, not quite as far away, not at, at redshifts past six or seven, but the redshift one or two where the universe was sort of half its current age. And it's seen a couple of stars flare up for a few months with the magnification that could only be explained in this way. So we hope to see this extreme gravitational lensing uh, with Webb as well, and hope to see some of the early stars in their black hole accretion disks directly um, through this lensing event. Yeah, we call those caustic transits because uh, these stars would have to individually go across these infinity points.
those numbers are staggering just yeah. to, to think about. It's, it's an, really impressive. Um, okay, our very last question for you. You mentioned today, you know, the not only we're launching James Webb Telescope on the 22nd here, which has a, a long future. We're already thinking about what comes after. These are really long projects. Uh, we talked about trying to get folks excited about these because there's future careers. So what's your advice for some of our young people or even folks that are on uh, the talk today who might be thinking about a career transition? How do they get involved with James Webb Telescope or even just this type of work? Well, I'd say go work for NASA and start planning for this next next mission, which is you know, it used to be called ATLAS. They're going to come up with a different acronym, but ATLAS, ATLAS means the Advanced Technology Large Area Space Telescope, or even work on some of these other large ground-based telescopes. This one to the right is called the Giant Magellan Telescope, and it's 10 times larger than Hubble. Again, it's the, the same relative size in these pictures. Uh, they started thinking about it uh, 20 years ago, but they are now working on real funding to make it happen. And again, the decadal survey just this last month ranked it very highly. So either go work on one of these large ground-based, and these are gigantic uh, enterprises that will take more than 20 years to build. And, uh, you know, these large telescopes can run for 100 years or more. The, the Mount Wilson telescope that was built in the early 1900s is still running today, and it's still a good telescope. So you could run this for many generations. Of course, if you built this at last telescope correctly, you could probably run it a lot longer than Webb and Hubble. How much longer? It depends on how many astronauts you can send to L2. You will certainly send it to L2 because that's sort of the darkest spot in the solar system that's nearby. Um, but it, it's going to be costly and it's going to take a long time to build. So I'd say go work for NASA. I have charts on that. We actually have um, a quite a few folks working in, in the NASA workforce today. Let me see if I can get to that. Uh, where do we have these charts? Yeah, so roughly a quarter of all our students end up either working as faculty at universities or as NASA researchers, or they work in industry, or you know they become teachers at community colleges. Some of our best students are natural born teachers and they do that and there's no shame to that either but go work for any of these things and here you see in a pie chart um you know with all the nasa folks they hired in the 70s and 80s retiring um where where the new jobs will be and there, and there will be quite a few in the next uh, decade quite a few people retiring so go work for nasa i'd say or work for one of the universities like asu that works for nasa what do you think are some of the the top majors? Because this is definitely um, you know a career path that likely takes um, college or university schooling and beyond. But um, you know what are some of the top majors that are being hired? Uh, well, you know if you get a major in astrophysics or space exploration or a major in engineering, um, you can go quite far. I think I have a last chart here. Uh, you may recognize some of the people in. Uh, in, in this annual Girl Scout stargazing event in front of the White House here, there's the president and his wife. And one of my grad students, Amber Strong, knew Michelle Obama through her Girl Scout activity. So she organized this event. And, you know, she now works for the Nobel laureate, John Mather. Um, but, you know, if you become a student here at ASU or some of the other uh, Pac-10 universities or just about any major university in the nation, you can start doing things like this. You never know where you'll end up. You might end up in the White House for a bomb. And she's done this several times, right? Because uh, they try to repeat this event every few years. Um, so there's a lot of good things for you young folks to do. Get, get a degree. It always helps to have a degree, whether it's in astrophysics or, or physics or, or math or engineering or space science. It almost doesn't matter. As long as you're interested in developing things and building things, um, then you're good. Of course, I'll have to throw out the plug. You always join events like this, learn a little bit more, come down to the Science Center. We have the Dorrance Planetarium available for you to learn just a little bit more um, until you get to that next phase of your, well, let's say your, your learning career. So we're out of time for today, but Dr. Winhurst, this has been an absolutely amazing conversation. Thank you so much for your time and for joining us today. Sure, I'll be happy to hang around for a few more minutes and answer some more of the questions you guys and ladies asked. Really great questions. Thanks for doing that. And I hope to see you around at NASA. 
or at the university. Thank you. So thank you to all of you at home. This concludes our virtual chat for tonight. We're going to stick around for just a couple minutes. And uh, if there's any lingering questions, we can converse through the chat. Uh, if you want more information about the launch for the James Webb Telescope, which is coming up on December 22nd, you can find that information online at jwst.nasa.gov. And it's all the information you ever wanted about the James Webb Telescope. And of course, you can always find more science and more information online from Arizona Science Center at azscience.org. All right, stay safe, stay curious, and we'll see you guys next time. All right, sounds good. Am I still sharing? Uh, you um, are. Yep, you got the website right up there. We got the plug. 12 days, 9 hours, 33 minutes, and 49. <laughs> 40 minutes. Counting down. <laughs> Counting down. Okay. All right, I'll go back to the questions because I don't think I answered everything. And so you, had, you folks had some very good questions. Great. So if anybody's sticking around, um, we can do that. There are a couple great questions. I want to make sure that we wrapped it up. But um, I see we've got some folks who are still here. Um, so I'm going to go through all of them. Yeah. Okay. I'll start at the top. You tell and, me where to start. Okay. I'll just start at the top. So where do we want the telescope to end up in space? We kind of talked about that. Do we yeah, want it yeah. to be like Voyager missions and leave the solar system? Or do we want it to stay in the solar system? Um, no, we want it to stay in the solar system. In fact, we want it to stay right behind um, the Earth from the perspective of the sun, behind the Earth and the moon. Um, yeah, because that's the darkest place we can get where both the Earth and the sun and the moon will always be behind the sun shield. All right, so our next question, um, how did you get selected to be part of this project? Well, I had to write a big proposal, which I did in 2001. I think it was almost 100 pages, but then there was a peer review and, and they picked our project. So uh, here we are 20 years later, still working on it. Fantastic. I love that connection though for yeah. Arizona. There's so much work happening. Um, even on this project, we, you know, I, I feel like we should have done the, the shout out for Northrop Grumman, which also has a presence here in Arizona. So they do. Um, yes. really great work happening in space science in Arizona. Okay, so next question um, from McKenna. How do you get the telescope into a spaceship? Uh, with a, a, a big um, crane from the ceiling of that building. So the rocket is built. Uh, the rocket maybe takes up three quarters of that enormously tall building that you saw the last picture of before I got to the science charge. And then the last 20% is to hoist the telescope up with the crane and put it on top of the rocket, which you can see here behind the, the countdown is sort of at the bottom of this capsule. It looks like a big pill. So this big pill, we call it a launch fairing. Uh, has two halves to it, and then those, of course, are not there yet. So the telescope is then being mounted on the rocket before you fire it off. You clamp it down real well, and then you put this double shell on, which is, um, um, you know, held together by clamps that auto-release at the right time. Yeah, excellent question. Really cool. All right, so we've got another question here. Um, what's the most interesting discovery you've made in your career thus far? Well, I would say uh, that we have found some of the very earliest galaxies that Hubble can see, and this was, in, you know, in the first billion years, uh, but, but not as far back as Webb will see him, which will be in the first 200 to 400 million years. And so we've done that with the Whitefield Camera 3 when it was first launched. In the early 2010s, it was launched in 2009, but it took us a couple of months to take the observations. And I would say those are some of the most interesting things we've done with Hubble. And, do you, think, uh, and do you think James Webb is going to top that? Oh, yeah, I will go much further because it has so Hubble simply runs out of steam at redshifts around eight or nine. It, it sees an occasional object that most people can't agree on what the distance and the age is. And, and Webb will have so much more infrared leverage to, to push further back in time and in space and in redshift. So exciting. Yeah. All right. So Sydney had a question. And Sydney, I see, is still on as well. So how is a star formed if they die and become black holes? Well, very briefly, uh, the stars burn through their periodic system. They 75% hydrogen, 24% helium when they form, and the rest is all the other elements. They turn the hydrogen into helium and then the helium into carbon and nitrogen and oxygen. When they're done with that, they have not much else left to burn. So low mass stars like the sun will just become a white dwarf and throw out their 
other layers. That's it for the lifetime of the sun. It happens in another five billion years from today. Uh, but massive stars will either leave a neutral star, a neutron star, or a black hole behind. A baby black hole when they explode. Let's see, there's another black hole question here. There's a couple black hole questions. We knew they would come up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, can a galaxy have more than one black hole in the center? Yeah, that's what will happen to our galaxy when it merges when Andromeda, the two central black holes. Our galaxy has about 4 million and Andromeda about 10 million solar masses. And they will merge to form an almost 14 million solar mass black hole. Yeah, but for a while, they will have two black holes because they'll need to spin around each other before they merge and, and form gravitational waves, of course. Curious to see what that experience would be like, but I'm glad I also won't be here um, when that happens. So if the monster black hole that forms, though, uh, is the biggest, um, and we talked about those 14 billion year old babies, uh, how long is the lifespan of a black hole? Well, they could live on forever, although uh, our, our good friend Steve Hawking has said that they will eventually evaporate if you give them enough time, because antiparticles will fall in and they will sacrifice some of their mass. But uh, if you make a supermassive black hole, it will be a long time before it evaporates. I think it will be around much longer than the stars like the sun and even the galaxies. It would be around for many hundreds of billions of years, many times the current lifespan of the universe. All right, we've got another question on black holes. So uh, if the humans are still on Earth with the merging of the black holes, will it kill us? Valid question. Uh, probably not unless the accretion disk that forms the merging of those two black holes uh, squirts out a relativistic jet in our direction, which is unlikely. It will probably um, push it more towards the, the, you know, not the plane, but the poles of the galaxy. Now, we'll be long dead by then because the sun will no longer be around. So hopefully, you know, humanity will have moved to other um, stars if that is even possible but that's five billion years out so not to worry about it we'll be looking for a new home so right fingers yeah. crossed maybe we'll find that with at last who knows yeah maybe so great questions so let's see oh sydney is 10 years old <laughs> and yeah. yeah if you saw yep yeah, so sydney is still glued to the screen so sydney you've got some great questions tonight so um thank you for asking those we actually have our last question tonight um what do you mean at, at one point you referenced the end of the universe and, and that may have been a turn of phrase but um this person would like to know does that mean there aren't any more galaxies past a certain point yeah so th this is something we discuss um in our asd 320 two course that I teach in, in the spring. And um, so we have other uh, things in the universe other than dark matter and black holes. We also have dark energy and the dark energy actually lets the expansion accelerate. This was a Nobel prize for a discovery made in 98, 99. The prize was given in 2011. And so we know the universe will start expanding faster and faster into the future, which will eventually mean that galaxies other than Andromeda, which are going to collide with us, will eventually expand beyond our horizon. We can't see them anymore. And very, very far into the future, we're talking about a trillion years from now, not a million or a billion, but a trillion, all the atoms will start flying apart too, we think. But don't want to think about that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's too far, it's too far fetched into the future, but it probably will happen if those models and those observations are correct. And it looks like that. I think that's the end of our, our question list here. We answered every question that our audience came up with. And I want to just double check the chat. I don't see any others over here. Um, but this has been above and beyond. Thank you for the encore presentation with the extra questions here and for joining us tonight. Um, and thank you for everybody who hung out. We still had a, we've got like the hardcore audience here uh, that kept with us for an extra half an hour. So thank you all um, tonight. Again, Dr. Winters, thank you so much for your knowledge and for all the work that you're sure. doing uh, to support STEM and to support space exploration. It's very exciting. Sure. Well, I hope that some of the young folks in the audience will uh, will take astrophysics or space science. I'll answer one more question of John, Jonah Webb. Was Van Gogh any influence? Yeah, I have some of his pictures here, not originals, of course, but I think his art reminds me often 
of what galaxies look like. So, and I think he was actually inspired by some of the earliest galaxy photographs that people took 150 years ago. Oh, and I missed that. So, hey, good eyes yeah. in the chat there. Thank you. And great question. Yeah, sure. Good intersection there, too. All right. So um, for those of you, since you are sticking around, I'll let you know that um, in a couple of days, we will post this recording on the Science Center's YouTube channel and share it out. So look for it there if you want to come back and revisit this or if you want to share with those friends that had to jump off and let them know we answered a few more questions at the end. So thank you again for joining us and be safe and have a wonderful night. Thank you all. Great questions. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you again. Really, truly great. All right. Take care, everybody. Take care. All right. So you know where to find me in case there's any other questions. Yep. I do. I'm yep. going to stop recording us now here. Okay.